All right, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. The Lord rocked me with this scripture about a week ago, and I've been studying it and, and researching what it means. And I really believe the Lord has a word for us as a church. And I'm calling this message Attitude, Christianity 401. Because I really believe that your attitude is one of the things that changes the most when you are truly surrendered 100% to Christ. Not just a Christian in name, but a Christian in commitment. Your attitude will be different if you're a Christian. 1 Timothy 1, 18 and 19, please. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, mm. having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. I read this scripture, and I never, and I, then I, I did, of course, research on it in terms of the original Greek language, and it's, it's amazing. It says, listen, Timothy, my son, in terms of he loved this person. He, he had a great attitude towards Timothy, who wasn't really his son in the physical realm. He was a spiritual son. Just because you may not have physical sons or daughters does not mean you cannot have spiritual sons and daughters. You can. In this case, he calls him a son, and he says, according to the prophecies, and what it really means is, it, it, it's an interesting word. It says, these prophecies should lead you. Did you know that? That's what a prophecy should do. A prophecy should never discourage you. It should lead you. And it says, it should lead you. The prophecies that were made concerning you should lead you. And the word, I, I like this part, that by them, by them what? By the prophecies you may wage the good warfare. It's an interesting scripture because it literally means this. It says that you might wage war, a beautiful war. Amen. I don't know if you ever saw Braveheart. Many, many years ago I saw it, and I think I saw it on TV recently. And he says, Ay, it's a good day to die. Just like, Arr. It's a beautiful war. And prophecy should lead you to win that war. It's attitude. This is all about attitude. When my kids play soccer, that's the big thing. And when my, my, my three sons played basketball, when my daughter Isabel played basketball, I talked to them mostly about attitude. I wasn't a great basketball player. I, I was a good, very good hockey player, not a good basketball player. So I couldn't teach them technique, but I could teach them attitude. Attitude's really important. In fact, I got a couple of slides. See, an attitude is a way a person views something or tends to behave towards it. It's how you view things. And, and there's another definition that says, an attitude is an expression of favor or disfavor towards a person, a place, a thing, or an event. I saw someone on Facebook the other day, they go, I hate Mondays. Okay, that's your attitude towards Mondays. I hate, fr I hate Thursdays. <laughs> you know, I hate when it rains. I hate the sun. I hate when it's hot. Well, then move out of Vegas. See, your attitude can be towards a person or a thing, and it's an expression of who you are. I like what Winston Churchill said. He says, an attitude is a little thing that makes a big difference. Winston Churchill. Before the war, he was one of the worst politicians. He was ridiculed. I mean, he, he was very particular. If you've ever seen pictures of Winston Churchill, he was, not a, you know, he was not known for being a great political leader. But during the war, he rose up because of his attitude. And I've, I've quoted him many times. In fact, I have the whole series of his volumes that he wrote during, before and during and after the war. It's a really amazing series. And I have the original series. See, some attitudes are cultural. Some attitudes are generational. Some attitudes are family attitudes. Some are national attitudes. I can tell you that in India, there's a national attitude. I can go through India, and even though uh, many, there's a lot of wealth in India, most of India, probably 97%, are in abject poverty. You'll see bulls walking down roads and pigs, and it's just, it seems like utter, complete chaos there. There's an attitude there. There's an attitude towards women. It's been hitting the news recently a lot about the attitudes towards women in India. There's gang rapes, and you've seen some of those. I hope you read the paper. It's, it's been in there. Just recently, I was reading USA Today, and it talked about uh, this new movement that's called um, Knockout Game. And what they're doing is these young kids are walking down streets of any given city and randomly knocking someone out. And then they post it on video, and they put it on YouTube or something. 
And what's happening is, it's not really a game because some people have actually died. There was one video I saw in USA Today where some guy, it's, we used to call it in my age, a sucker punch. And basically they're sucker punching these people, knocking them out, and then their heads are hitting the cement or something. I saw another video yesterday also when I was preparing where a man was walking, just walking down the street and cold cocks a woman from behind, knocks her out totally on the ground. Her face hits the cement. I mean, it's, it's not a game. It's just a sucker punch. But this is part of our culture right now. And what USA Today was very interesting in their analysis. They said, it goes to show you that we're not teaching respect in our schools. You want to get God out of schools? That's the stuff you're going to see. All right, you go ahead and get God out. You try to get him out of school. You're going to, you're, one day you're going to scream for God to come back into schools. How many more Columbines do we need? How many more... Uh, murders do we need on the college campuses? How many 12-year-olds do need to go into uh, sexual prostitution? There's, I, I heard someone talk to me the other day. I think it was uh, someone was working with sex trade in here in Vegas. They said the average age of a child caught in sex slavery in our city is 13 years old. There's a problem, friends. There's a really big problem here. And I believe we have an open door this week. The worse our nation gets, the worse our city gets, the more our attitude will make a difference. Your attitude could be the salvation of your family. We just spent the last several days with our family. My, my father-in-law who's suffering with dementia right now. Attitude's really important right now in how we deal with him. My mom's 93. She thought she was dying the day I arrived at her apartment. She felt she was going to die. Then she asked us to pray. And all of a sudden, she came back. And she told me two days later, she says, Honey, I thought I was dying. She said, but you prayed for me. Denise prayed for me. And then even the last night we were there, we went out with my, my, one side of my family, and one of my family members who's not serving the Lord said, Paul, remember when, what, nine years ago, my mom had two strokes. She was in her 80s. They, everybody said she was going to die. She says, but remember what you did when you prayed for her? And now we've gained another, what, 12 or 13 years with my mom. Um, your attitude, people are watching your attitude and I'm telling you, this Thanksgiving week, if there's ever been a time for you to affect your whole family, in fact, over there you saw on the right-hand side, yeah, my grandkids have attitude. Their papa teaches them attitude all the time. They're just wild. But top right is part of Denise's family, and her brother stood up, who was suffering with, um, um, oh golly, I, I can't remember, it's very, very serious disease, but he's been healed. I mean, it's just an amazing story. And he stood up in front of the whole family and led them in prayer. That's never happened before. I've been married to Denise 33 years. Never happened before. And, uh, and he, he mentioned the example that Denise and I have made in their family. And sometimes you don't think you're making an impact. Because it, it don't, you know, you, it, how many have ever been discouraged by your family? Come on now. I Man, I walked away from my family gathering this past time and going, golly, they're dysfunctional. It's like I, <laughs> and then we went to Denise's family, and we saw some really amazing things happen. But Denise has been a an amazing. She was the only girl because we were all raised Catholic, and uh, you know, at first I was the Protestant kid that stole Denise away, and they didn't like me very much. And and now they're all leaning towards us as an inspiration to them, um, and Denise is an inspiration for her family. But it's really been because of attitude. It's not because bad things haven't happened. It's because we have a good attitude. So I put some uh, slides, guys, of uh, posters. I, I love posters, and I like, you know, sayings that inspire me, inspiration. So go to the, some of the slides, Chad, that you, attitude is a magnet. What you think is what you attract. You're wondering why you're surrounded by negative people? Probably because you're negative. Okay, next one. Oh, attitude, a consistent, po ooh, 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 ooh. A p consistent positive mental attitude is a force that, that enables the beholder to overcome even the deepest hindrances. That's powerful. Next one. In the middle of every difficulty lies opportunity. Albert Einstein. <laughs> it's your attitude, not your aptitude, that determines your altitude. You know, we've been here, we've been leading this church for now, going on 21 years. And there's been people that I've actually taken down from their position. Talented people. Talented, talented people. But their attitude stunk. So I'd have to remove them. Sometimes I paid for their counseling. I said, you know what? Your attitude stinks. You're gifted. You're anointed. But your attitude doesn't reflect our attitude. 
and I believe the attitude of Jesus Christ. I've fired people because of their attitude, not because they weren't talented. Attitude, Christianity 401. I believe it should be the number one thing that people see in your life. From, from the day you get saved, it should be a continuing progress of improved attitude. And I, 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 this is four things real quick that I want to give you today. I believe they're, they're significant. First Chronicles 28, verse 9, please. First Chronicles, and you, Solomon, yeah. my son, obey the God of your father and serve him with a submissive attitude and a willing spirit. For the Lord examines all minds and understands every motive of one's thoughts. If you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you abandon him, he will reject you permanently. Father teaching son about attitude. Can I be honest with you? You learned your attitude from your family. You did. From your coaches. From your teachers. From your peers. Good char- bad character corrupts good... A bad company corrupts good character. I can tell you as a parent, one of, my, one of our number one duties was to make sure that the right people hung around our kids. The right teacher. I tell you what, I was vigilante when it came to my kids, even my grandkids. Uh, I was vigilante. That's why when you applied to the school, um, I wanted to make sure, Andrea, that you were one of our teachers because your attitude was always amazing. I saw my grandkids in preschool, and I thought, I want my grandkids to be around this lady. I'm telling you. I'm very careful about that, friends, because if you allow your children to be affected by bad authority figures... I'm not just talking about those that sexually abuse children. I've done many, many seminars on pre- pre- protecting your child from sexual abuse. I- I've done seminars on that all over the place. Because guess what? Sexual abuse is a big problem. But I'm just talking about pure attitude. If your kid is on a team where the coach has a bad attitude, change teams. If your kid is in a classroom where the teacher has a bad attitude, change classrooms. One of the big things for the teachers of ICA, they have amazing attitudes. Because that's one of our number one requirements for a teacher in our school is their attitude has to reflect our attitude. And if they don't, they don't belong on our team. I've been on some pretty amazing athletic teams. I, 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 but I, and I can tell you something. It's the attitude. It's not necessarily the talent level. It's the attitude level. You can have one bad attitude corrupt an entire sports team. You can have one bad attitude corrupt a church. You can have one bad attitude, try to corrupt a family. That's why the Bible says, fight the good war. It's a beautiful war. And you fight it with prophecies that are supposed to lead you to help you hope and have faith. Does that make sense to everybody? See, I talk about attitude. I can list them for hours. Respect is an attitude. USA Today was correct. Honor is an attitude. That's why I love the military. Colonel Pete, I love your family. You can tell that your children honor you and your bride. I didn't argue in front of my children with my wife. Although we did argue, it wasn't in front of the kids because I always wanted to honor their mother. And if they ever want to see their dad ticked off, it's if they dishonored their mother. I want to tell you, if they disrespected Denise, it was game on. It was not a pretty thing because I knew that attitude in my family, you ever see my son preach or my son-in-law preach? Tonight, Lawrence is going to preach. I can't wait to hear it. He's not only one of the funniest people I know, he's one of the deepest people I know spiritually. I'm coming tonight at 5 o'clock to get fed. I am. I need to be fed spiritually. And I'm coming here to worship and experience God. So this morning I'm giving, but tonight I receive. That's why I come on Sunday nights. I love to get what God has. In fact, this Wednesday night, guess what you're supposed to do? We don't have church on Wednesday night, Thanksgiving week. Why? Because you're supposed to be with your family or friends, and you're supposed to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. You're the hope of your family. You are the great white hope, or the great brown hope, or the great black hope, or the great Filipino hope. You are the hope of your family. I'm telling you, friends, and it all goes back to your attitude. Trust me, if you're with your wife beforehand, I hate going to family gatherings. I just hate it. I can't believe it. Your family's so sick. (laughs) Trust me, everybody's going to feel it, and you'll be useless in that home. You'll be, in fact, you'll probably be worse than useless. You'll infect it in a negative way. I'm telling you, you have an open door, friends. I don't know how many years we have left before Christ returns. I just know 
that I don't know how many more years you have left. And I don't know how many more years Aunt Susie has left. I just helped perform the wedding of my brother who's 66 years old. His name's Mickey. He's the one that led me to Christ. His wife died about five years ago. We didn't expect her to die. She was 61. We, no one expected her to die so quickly. And she accepted Christ just a few months before with me at a service in Ottawa. That church that we've helped all these years, I was preaching there. She attended a French service with translation and she got saved. About a month later, she died. I know she's now in heaven. I know she's now in heaven. Someone say amen to that. Hey, Jesus might come back tomorrow. He might come back in 100 years. But can I tell you something? The friend or family member you're looking at that, that you despise or you resent or you're mad at, that person may not have one more day left. And it's up to you to shine for them. I know that your dad, David, I know that he's in not a good place. The cancer is there. I've been praying for your dad almost every single day. But I know you're the hope of your family. I know your mom's been struggling too. Aubrey, you're the hope of your family. And sometimes we don't feel like much of a hope. <laughs> you know, sometimes when we look at our own frailties, we go, well, I don't know if I can do it. Yes, you can, because you've got the Holy Spirit. You're the hope of all your friends. Your friends, your family. Aubrey, you're the hope. And God says, I believe in you enough that I make you the hope of your family. And sometimes we forget that. We forget that we are the hope, whether we respect others, whether we honor others, whether we love honors, others, whether we forgive others. At my brother's wedding, I, I walked to my brother who was getting married and I said, make sure you honor mom today. Mom's 93 years old. It's hard enough for her to get out of the chair. She hurts, she has pain all over the place. She says the other day, this week she says, dad, she says, honey, she says, and she called me different names at times, but she says, honey, it's not, <laughs> she's called me Bernie before, she's called me Mickey before. She says, you know what, it's not fun growing old. And she says, she just wants to go to heaven now. And I'll tell you what, my mom's super cool. And that morning of the wedding, guess what? She's eating an olive and she bites into the pip and breaks her front tooth. Do you have the picture of my mama? Can you put that up on the screen? That's my mom. Notice her front tooth. See, attitude is taught. My mom taught me that attitude. She went to the wedding she would smile with that big old gap between her teeth. We all joked that we said, oh, you should have seen the other guy. <laughs> I, I learned good attitude from my mom, not from my dad. My mom had an amazing attitude. <laughs> that night, even though her body was full of pain, I said, mom, you want to go? Because we were taking care of her. And, and before you know it, I went to get the car to bring in front of the, 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 the building. And, and all of a sudden, I see her get out of her seat. I was going to say jump, but that'd be a lie. And then she doesn't walk anymore. She shuffles. And she did the shuffle towards the dance floor. And I danced with my mom. I danced with my mom. I took video of it. I should have brought it today, and, and, uh, and I showed it to mom, and we're all laughing. She says, oh, I didn't think I was even moving. I said, oh, mom, you, I said, you were shaking your booty, mom. <laughs> oh, Paul. <laughs> now I can't read my notes. You got me all messed up, you guys. <laughs> Mercy's an attitude. Tenderness is an attitude. Humility's an attitude. Why don't we teach attitude in school anymore? It's up to us in our Sunday school classroom with our kids. It's up to us in youth group to teach attitudes. It's up to you in your home to teach attitude. A lot of times as parents, we, we concentrate on their grades. And I, I'm all for that. I mean, my kids all did well in school because we made it a priority. And I also rewarded it. But the thing that we rewarded most in our family was not whether they scored 10 points or in a game or they got five rebounds. or, or We rewarded that. Yes, we did. But the biggest thing was attitude. I honestly didn't care if they won or lost. I cared that they had a great attitude. I cared. I, one of the only times that I really, you know, confronted my son after game was not because he didn't score. It's because he was intimidated by the other team. We sat outside the Cox Pavilion on the court curb. I said, I need to talk to you, son. I said, are you proud of the way you played? No, dad. I said, I don't care if you scored or you fouled out or whatever. Do you feel like you gave 100%? No, dad. I said, okay, next game. All I care about, son, is that you give 100%. That's all I care about. All I care is you play fearless and you have a good attitude on the team and you support your teammates even when you're sitting on the bench. You wouldn't believe how many talks we had about that kind of stuff. 
that whether he's playing or not, he was a team player. Whether you, you, you think that, see, because as parents, the world will not teach them the right attitude. The world's going to teach them garbage. Media will teach them garbage. You're going to teach them the right attitude. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. The other thing that happens is, I believe that we're supposed to have a, see, it's a choice, obviously. And I believe that prophetically, that not only should we teach our friends and our family attitude, but I believe that attitude can actually be prophetic. Now let's break down, we'll go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, 18 and 19. Because I did a word study there, and I'm not going to spend long on it. But first of all, he says, my son. Now, could you read that one? Let's for, read just verse 18, please. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Wow. Some of you have never been able to have kids. Some of your kids have, they just got up and walked away from the family. They're not really connected. And you say, well, what about me? He never had kids. But Paul had this ability in his heart to have an attitude of love and acceptance. Do you know how many people call me Papa G? Because they've gotten close to us. You, know, you talk to Kristen, Elizondo, and, and James. They, become, they became part of our family. She was one to Christ through my daughter Isabel, and she just became part of our family, and we treat her like family. Jojo calls me dad, and, and I call him my son. I, see, you have to have a heart big enough, an attitude of acceptance, that whether you have physiological kids or not, you can have spiritual kids. And you can look to pass down a legacy to others. An attitude of love and appreciation and affection. You should be the most loving person at your next family gathering. You should be the one that appreciates that dinner and appreciates the person that came to you. You should be the one, the most affectionate one in that building. It was so funny this morning, I was at a coffee shop and uh, getting ready again. Last, I was there late last night and I was there again early this morning. And uh, so I hadn't been there because I was in Canada. And all of a sudden I had the, the waiters and I had the general manager last night came to me. It's good to see you. Great to have you back. And, and he always gives me free stuff. And, and uh, I'm so happy to see you. And, and then this morning I actually had one of the waitresses come up and say, I'm so glad you're here. And I put out my hand and she just gave me a hug. And people just walk up to me. Hey, I, I'm thinking, whoa. You know, it's just like, wow. Just because, you know, I, I just because that's how we should be. We should be affectionate and loving with people. We should be kind to people. It should be our attitude. You shouldn't be the sourpuss this year. You've got probably 40 days to end the year right. That's what those envelopes are about. That's what these tickets, you've got 40 days. I don't care if you screwed up the whole year. Can you at least finish the next 40 days strong? Everybody say with me, finish, this, finish it strong. Hey, you may not have been the sharpest knife in the drawer this year. You may have made bad mistakes. You may have been, had the worst attitude in the world. But can I tell you, if you finish strong, God's pleased with you. If you finish strong, God's pleased with you. He says, my son, according to the prophecies, let them lead you forward. Wage war with them. The word there in Greek, it's interesting. It's stratuo. It really, we get our word strategy from there. You know, Sarah Jane, you had a chance to preach, what, five times last week, and you're a little missionary from France, and now you're, you're influencing the sex trade in our state. Now, nationally, they're saying we're the prototype for how a church should help. I've just gone, golly, this stuff's crazy. But the word is stratuo, and that means you should strategize how your attitude is going to be a weapon. I'll tell you, you're going to go to family gatherings where everybody's going to be drunk but you. That should be your strategy. I'll be the only sober person in that building. And I'll drive them home that night, one by one, without condemning them. I'll hug them, and I'll love them, and I'll help wipe up their vomit. I'm telling you, friends, you have the best attitude in that place. You're right. That office might stink. Everybody must be, might be idiots in your mind right now. But if that's your attitude, you'll bring it there. And you won't be able to be the representation for Jesus. There, you're, friends, you're the only hope they have. They may never meet me or someone else in this place, but they're going to meet you. And if you're just sourpuss about them and negative and you remember all the times that they did something bad, you'll never have a good strategy. You have to have the strategy. My attitude is going to make the difference. And it says wage the good war. The, literally the word there in the Greek is a beautiful war. I know Colonel Pete, you know, he, he, he drops bomb. He drops missiles. I'm sorry, I said bombs the other day. You know, he flies an F-15. It's 15? It's 15. And he shoots missiles. And the way he talks about war, it's like a beautiful war. 
I mean, you talk to this guy, it's like, wow, I wish I had an F-15 and those missiles. He doesn't talk about it as something negative. And, and Lieutenant, you know, Lieutenant Colonel David Henzi, a Marine, you talk to these guys. My, my, my nephew, five tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. I just saw him the other day. And you know, yes, they, they saw horrible things, but guess what? It's a beautiful war. They're representing our nation. They're representing liberty. They're representing democracy. God bless them. I love their attitude. I love their attitude. Wage a beautiful war. And you're right. It's not easy living in a lost world. It's not living easy living in a dysfunctional family. It's not easy going to some of these gatherings. But you have a chance right now. You invite them. Even if they tell you ten times no, you invite them again. You can either please people or you can please God. It's a prophetic attitude. And you begin to release great things on their life. A great attitude is the next one. A great attitude builds relationships. I got a picture of Denise and uh, my sister Elaine, and I, I don't know how the picture got cut off. It's my fault, not theirs. But, but I want to tell you something. I, I ha- we went in there two days. All we did is clean my, my mom's apartment. And we threw away an old carpet. And we threw an old computer desk away. And we went and bought a brand new carpet. And, and we just bought her stuff. And we fixed the whole apartment up. And we bought them Christmas ornaments and Christmas stuff. And, and we just... Spent two days scrubbing floors and baseboards. I had a picture of my wife on the floor, uh, but I thought that was a better picture of her. (laughs) But I'll tell you what, we worked our tail off for two days. The family can't get over that. They go, why do you do this? Because I want my attitude to be the best attitude. I I want my attitude to inspire others because my attitude is going to affect my actions. And my actions are going to affect my family. You see, what happens is, friends, they're going to tell if you're a generous person or not. Or maybe you're going to be the biggest cheapskate in your family. Maybe you're going to, you know, going to be the Scrooge this, this Thanksgiving or, or Christmas, Christmas. You're going to be the biggest Scrooge in your family. But I want to challenge you. Be the opposite. Be the opposite. We're talking with some of Denise's family, and a couple years ago, the Lord spoke to Denise and I about to buy a car for her mom. Her mom didn't have the money to buy a car, and so Denise says, what do you think? I said, absolutely, go and do it, baby. We bought a car. And then all of a sudden, now all the families starting to chip in and help their family in their retirement years. One thing after another. They're doing it now. They're doing it now. And they credit our example. Now, are we proud of ourselves? No, but I feel pretty good about the fact that we're doing something for God. I feel pretty good that I'm doing something for my family. I feel pretty good that I'm helping others. I feel pretty good that we gave clothes and we fed people this week like we do every... Tonight, we're going to give away tons and tons of food. Every Sunday night, we give away food. Every Wednesday night, I feel pretty good about that. There's some people say, well, you shouldn't feel good about it. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says he wants to share his glory with us. The Bible says we're supposed to be partners with Jesus Christ. I feel pretty good about when I do the right thing. Okay, let me give you an example. How many feel bad when you do the wrong thing? Okay? Well, I want to make sure. If anybody's hand's not up, you're scaring me right now. Can I have the worship team up here? How many of you feel bad when you do something bad? Come on now. But how many of you feel good when you do something good? You say, well, I thought I'm not supposed to be proud and all that. No, the Bible says you're his partner and you're spo- he wants to share his glory with you. You should feel good when you do something good. You should feel good when you donate a coat. You should feel good when you donate a car. You should feel good. There's a man in our church that donated a bunch of stuff that the, the missions department's going to sell it and then we're going to give all the money to missions. He should feel good about that. You should feel good about the, the 200 prisoners that you helped reintegrate in society. You and your team. This week, this year, 200 this year alone. You should feel good about it. The Holy Spirit's in you, and when you feel good, that's from God. You you feel good, George. Every time you usher someone in here, and you flash them that wonderful smile, and you love on people, you've been an example for 10, 15 years. You and your husband are so amazing. Royal Rangers, all the stuff you're doing for young kids. I'm so proud of you guys. If you could simply understand how God feels about you, every week I could spend an hour and a half just talking about good people in our church. People that I, come on now, give the Lord, give them a hand clap. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We have a strategy this week. Before you leave, I'm going to ask you to pick up these tickets and donate whatever you feel led to donate. And then you, you can say, listen, I, 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 I got this for you. I want to invite you and your husband. I want you to put these on cars. I want to be face to face, eye to eye, shaking hands, saying, this is, last year I had more veterans from the Vietnam War come up weeping, 
There was an 80-year-old man that fought in the Second World War, 80-something. He fought in the Second World War, Korean War, I can't remember. And he came up and gave his life to Christ as an 80-something-year-old. You know how rare it is for an 80-something-year-old person to accept Christ? He came up because of the play, accepted Christ. Jessica's grandfather, weeping with Jessica, accepting Jesus. I saw more veterans come to Christ last Christmas than ever before because we're going to honor the veterans in this play. We're going to honor. I'm going to honor my father and my mother. My mother is so cool. The other day, she's 93, and, and I saw a picture of her. She just got a medal for serving two years in the military. She was in the Navy for two years during the war as a volunteer. She's called a Navy Wren. My mom. Attitude. So at the end of the service, come on up here and throw something in the bucket, whatever's on your heart. And if you can give a lot, give a lot. If you can't, just give a little. Grab 10 tickets and, and then start praying over them. Say, Lord, I, I pray these 10 people all accept Christ. Imagine if even just 80% of them accept Christ. It's going to be a pretty good statistic. It's my prayer that you and I will partner and will have a great attitude. Can you read this last scripture, please? We ought to thank God always for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith flourishes more and more, and the love of each one of you is one of each one of you all for one another is ever greater. Wow. Do you always thank God for your family? Husbands, do you thank God for your wife? Women, do you thank God for your husband? For your kids? Sometimes the, the one we don't give enough thanks for are the ones that are closest to us. We get frustrated. We get an attitude of offense. Just the other day I saw a family member just totally ruin his testimony. And afterwards, he said, I, I, I know I just ruined my witness. Yeah, you did. And it was all because of an offense from, two year, from a year and a half, two years ago, a year and a half ago. All because of the offense, that person just blew up, lost it, and knew that he'd ruined his witness. He's right. He's right. People are looking at us on how we're going to respond to stress. They're looking at us to see how we're going to respond at a Christmas party. They're, they're looking to see if you're going to compromise, if you're going to flirt, if you're going to get drunk and fall. Forth. They're looking on how you're going to respond to any temptation and any conflict. They're watching you. And the Bible says, if I always give thanks, the Bible says, Philippians 2.5, may you have the same attitude towards others that Christ had. Last time I checked, Jesus hung out with prostitutes and tax collectors. Never judged them. But he also didn't fold and didn't fall into temptation. He actually just lived out a great attitude with them and accepted them and embraced them and loved them. I see 40 days to end this year right. 40 days to end this year right. 40 days. My French Canadian friends from Ottawa, it's good to see you guys. They were with me Sunday in Ottawa when I preached to their church. It's great to see you guys. But we have 40 days.